over to John. John, would you like me to share your PowerPoint now or do you have some things to talk about? Yeah, go ahead and pull it up, Jamie. And um, Jamie and uh, Mark and Katrin, thank you so much for having me on today. And it's a real privilege to speak to all of you in a global audience. I will do my best to keep the uh, those who are on at nine or 10 at night uh, overseas awake uh, <laughs> for the hour that we're here. And um, certainly it, it's wonderful to be able to speak to such a diverse group of people. Um, so I have been thinking and writing about this topic of purpose for some time. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, I've authored this book with HBR as well as a prior book. In my day job, I actually work as an executive at a financial institution. And so this topic has been near and dear to my heart for a while. Um, Jamie, if we flip ahead, you know, one of the ways that it started for me is um, focusing on our prior book, Oh, am I back, Jamie? Sorry, you're I cut back. out. Yep. You're, you're yeah. So one of the ways this started for us was about 10 years ago, I wrote my first book for Harvard Business Review. Uh, my colleagues and I were coming out of the great financial crisis at that time. And we were at an institution where a number of the people who were somewhat responsible for the financial crisis had graduated. And yet we looked around our classmates and we thought that they were charting a fundamentally different approach to leadership. So we wanted to write what we thought was a book on next generation leadership trends, things like globalization, uh, a focus on learning and development, et cetera. And there was one theme that stuck out throughout the course of that book. And it was this topic of wanting to find meaning and purpose in work. For a group that had lived through uh, 9-11 in the United States, through the tumult of the early 2000s, through the global great financial crisis in the 08, 09 timeframe, there was this distrust of institutions and there was also this idea that work had to mean something more than a paycheck, that you wanted to get some sort of meaning or purpose from work. If you'd flip ahead, Jamie, you know, we didn't intend that to be a topic of the book, and yet it was something that ran through almost everyone that we spoke to. There was this idea that people wanted not just to, to make a good paycheck or even to be happy, but really to flourish. Um, the ancient Greeks defined this as eudaimonia, which is not just a combination of happiness, but of doing good things, right, of really prospering in the human spirit. And we found that there was this deep desire amongst the folks that we talked to, to find deeper engagement and flourishing and purpose at work. If we flip ahead, Jamie, the, uh, the sad thing is so many people around the world right now are not flourishing. So all of you know someone I would imagine uh, who you would think of as flourishing, a person that you find really impressive, someone who seems really fulfilled in their life, someone who has deep positive relationships, who has meaningful work, uh, who seems to be happy with the way that their lives are going. And yet, if you look at, at survey data from around the US and around the world, many people are really struggling to flourish right now. Surveys on general happiness, for example, are at their lowest levels in uh, the recording of these surveys. And that's even pre-COVID, obviously where the last two years would have disrupted this further. Things like stress, worry, and anger are actually up in places like the United States. And you see mirror image data from around the world. If you flip ahead, Jamie, the, uh, you can see additional survey data that indicates that um, people are lonelier and more distraught than they've been. So again, looking at US data, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, only about 11 to 20% of people regularly felt lonely. And yet, if you look now uh, in the 2010s, that's closer to 40 to 45%. And again, I'd hesitate to even look at what it looks like after COVID with so many people isolated, with so many people cut off from their traditional social networks, with so many people working remotely, which has its benefits, but often leads to greater isolation. And so these feelings of hopelessness and loneliness only rise. And Jamie, you were talking about colleges as we came in, um, even amongst college students, about half of college students experience hopelessness in any given year, and about 60% experience loneliness. In the most social environment imaginable, people are still feeling isolated, they're feeling lonely, they're feeling distraught. What's the matter, right? We've seen this incredible prosperity breaking out, and yet that prosperity around the world has not been accompanied by an increase in feelings of happiness or engagement or meaning. 
If you flip one more slide, that extends deeply to the feeling of purpose and meaning at work. If you begin to look at some of the survey data, if you begin to look at some of the survey data on the following page, the um, only around a quarter of Americans right now said that they have a strong, strong sense of purpose and 40% say that they don't. While nine of 10 employees would trade income for meaning in their work, Globally, only around 15% of employees are engaged, one five percent That means, especially with a global audience here, that, that really only about one to two out of 10 employees in any given company are feeling engaged at work at any time. Maybe that comes as a surprise to you, but in a group of 45 people, I would assume there are actually people on this, on this call who are feeling disengaged at work, who don't feel like they have a great sense of meaning professionally and who are struggling with, with this. Um, one of the most interesting graphs on the right there to me is this idea that your job and your career, while it's the place you spend the majority of your waking hours, typically 40 to 50 hours a week for most people, it ranks uh, dead last, at least among this list, of places that you find your most important sense of meaning or purpose behind caring for pets, listening to music, and reading. Uh, so those things are important, but man, if you're going to spend the majority of your waking hours at something, wouldn't it be great if it had a greater sense of engagement, meaning, or purpose? Um, flip ahead one more, Jamie. I think a lot of this can be traced uh, to a fundamental misunderstanding of meaning and purpose. If you look on average around the world, most of the rest of the world, most of the world is more prosperous, safer, uh, more physically healthy than they were 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. There are pockets that are exceptions to that where people struggle with real poverty or health challenges. Certainly over COVID, uh, we struggle with a global health challenge, and yet the averages around the world continue to go up. And yet all of these averages about meaning engagement go down. And I think what you can trace that to, uh, at least partially, is a fundamental gap in the feeling of purpose and meaning that people have in their lives. Flip one more slide. One of the contentions I have as I get into this is that we have a fundamental misunderstanding of meaning and purpose that I kind of think of as the Hollywood version of purpose. So hopefully this translates around the world. I know some of these are at least global blockbusters. Uh, but, you know, in, in a global blockbuster, there's often this mythology called the hero's journey where there's this normal person who's working a normal job. Think of Neo in the Matrix or Ray on Tatooine, who's leading a fundamentally kind of boring or normal existence, maybe even a depressing existence. And then out of nowhere, they're hit with this source of meaning that totally transforms their life, right? Bilbo Baggins is sent off on his search for uh, the ring of power to help save uh, Middle Earth. Spider-Man really finds a source of meaning in a mutation. There's this this something that transforms their life. And most of us have internalized this idea that we're all searching for this one so that we can have new purpose and meaning in whatever we do. I first encountered this the very first book event after I wrote my prior book, Passion and Purpose, 10 years ago. There was a young woman, I uh, was speaking at a college bookstore and she stood up at that time and asked the most obvious question in the world, but one for which I was totally unprepared. And it's the question on the screen here. How do I find my purpose? Something almost all of us have asked. And I don't remember exactly what I said at that time, but I remember it was totally unfulfilling. Despite writing a book with purpose in the title, I hadn't really thought about how to help people find their purpose. And over the next five or six years, as I went around and spoke about the book, as I reflected on this topic, I came to believe that part of the difficulty in answering that question is that the very question itself contains a fundamental misunderstanding of the topic of purpose. Like the hero's journey that actually makes it more difficult for each of us to encounter purpose. Flip one more slide, Jamie. I think inherently that one phrase has three fundamental problems with how we think about purpose. And I wanna walk through those and deconstruct them, both in the sense that we can try and find a greater purpose and meaning in our own work, but also in the sense that as leaders within our teams or within our companies, we can hopefully help others find greater purpose in their work as well. So the three myths inherent in that question, how do I find my purpose? Uh, the first is that purpose is a thing you find. 
right? It's right there. How do I find my purpose? And I think instead that purpose is something that you build. We've all met people in different professions that you'd think would be purposeful, teachers, doctors, uh, others who are helping people every day who don't seem happy in their work. Meanwhile, we've met people in relatively monotonous jobs or jobs that could seem monotonous, like driving a bus or working as a cashier, who seem happy, who seem joyful, who seem engaged in their work. My contention is that purpose isn't something that you find. There's not one perfect profession or one perfect interest for most people. Instead, purpose is something you have to work to actively craft into your professional life and into your personal life in everything that you do. And we'll dive into that more deeply. The second myth I find is that purpose is a single thing. Uh, so remember again that question, how do I find my purpose? Purpose is singular. And when that young lady asked me, how do I find my purpose? She was looking for me to help her find an answer that would fundamentally recreate her life at that time, a professional pursuit that could shape who she was for the rest of her life. If I could go back, I think what I'd say is, look, you probably already have a ton of sources of purpose in your life right now. You've got family, you've got friends, you're in different communities, you support different causes, you're bettering your professional development, your education. All of those things are sources of purpose. And if instead of thinking of one single thing to transform our lives, we open ourselves to this idea that purpose is all around us every day and try and craft purpose into everything that we do, I think it can be a much more powerful concept. One of the examples I use for this is, uh, is the famous example of Marie Curie. Uh, most of you have probably heard of Marie Curie. She was one of the greatest uh, scientists in history. Uh, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in the sciences. And in fact, she won two Nobel Prizes in two different scientific disciplines, something almost no one else has done. One of the greatest scientists in history. One would think that that's the sole motivation of her life. And yet if you dig into who Marie Curie was more deeply, you'd find that she has the same type of ripped, rich tapestry of life that the, purpose, uh, that the most purposeful people you know have. Uh, she had a husband, Pierre, who was actually her lab partner. She had such a great relationship with Pierre that she actually wrote a book about him, uh, which is pictured here upon his passing. And she even had a family. And in fact, her two daughters uh, went on to remarkably successful careers. Her daughter, Irene, actually won a Nobel Prize herself. Uh, so she not only won two, uh, she, she helped to mentor someone who won one in her own right. And her other daughter was an incredible journalist. And so even when we unpack these singularly focused and accomplished individuals, we often find that there are multiple sources of meaning or purpose in their lives. The third myth I think we need to unpack is the idea that purpose is stable over time. So that question, how do I find my purpose? Assume that there's one thing that will give the rest of our life meanings forever. And yet, I think that puts too much pressure uh, on people to find the perfect thing in any given point. Instead, I think most of us go through natural transitions in life uh, where we experience different types of purpose at different phases. When you're a college student, you're focused on personal development. You might be uh, focused on finding friends or a community or even a life partner. When you graduate and you start your job, you're focused on making an impact there or progressing. At some point, you might have kids, you might have grandkids, and these different phases of life actually usher in new sources of purpose. Taken all together, I think these myths can help us deconstruct uh, some of the most fundamental problems with an understanding of purpose itself and instead allow us to create this rich tapestry of purpose all around us that can prevent us from experiencing the type of anxiety that I think follows trying to just find one thing. So what we're gonna do in the rest of the presentation is uh, to go through a couple of these topics in greater detail. I'm gonna skim through those relatively quickly. We're gonna leave some time for questions at the end uh, so that we can address the topics most on your mind. And as Jamie just messaged, if you have questions along the way, I'd be happy to, uh, to take on, those on as well and try and think through uh, what's on your mind so that we can, we can try and address this topic of purpose together. Before we get started, Jamie, I wanna go to the next slide and let's hope this video works. Uh, I think there are some people who get this kind of approach to purpose. And if the video works here, uh, this is a great example for me of someone who really took the topic of crafting their purpose seriously. And Jamie, if the PowerPoint is working, you should just be able to click that as long as you've accepted uh, the media and it will play an online video. If it doesn't work, I'll just describe it.
it might not be working. Um, let's see. Okay. We don't have to worry about it. We can go back. One of the greatest examples that I'd encourage you to, uh, to Google afterwards, because it is so compelling, is this guy, Curtis Jenkins. And you can uh, Google Curtis Jenkins bus driver, and you'll see a clip of him. Uh, this was an individual from a Dallas school district uh, who, was, who was a bus driver, a school bus driver. Um, I assume we have these uh, overseas in different areas as well. But Curtis could have know. a really... I'm I sorry? Play that. Um, you said Curtis. I could, I could just look it up and play it if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great if you can uh, if you Curtis. can find it really quickly. So Curtis, Curtis Jenkins, bus driver, should be on YouTube and it should be a news clip. Okay, got it. It's worth the wait, folks. I guarantee. I still tear up when I uh, when I watch it. So hopefully people will enjoy it. And it's such a great articulation of some of the concepts I'm talking about. Looks like Vanit may have a link right there. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Does this look right? Uh, that is a VRBO ad, but I think that's the right one. Um, perfect. That's it. Not getting any audio there, Jake. Yeah, no audio coming through right now. No audio. No, no audio. Don't know if closed captions will do it justice. Well, I'll, uh, why don't you guys go back and, and um, watch it later and I'll continue. But Curtis, uh, it really is inspiring. You know, I actually worked with a school district at one point and being a bus driver is one of the toughest jobs out there. If you're unfamiliar, um, you have a bus full of kids. Uh, you have to drive the same route every day. And what was magical about the way that Curtis approached it was he really reconceived of his job uh, from driving kids from point A to point B to being a real caretaker and a counselor to those kids who were in his care every day. He took a job that could be monotonous, that could be unfulfilling. And as you'll see in the clip, he really almost adopted these kids. He viewed uh, his opportunity as being the first adult they saw every day on their way to school and the last adult they saw before they got home. Uh, he gave them each jobs on the bus. Some of the kids talked about how they wished uh, their own parents were like Curtis. And he transformed this job that could otherwise seem without meaning into something incredibly meaningful. If we flip ahead, Jamie, to the next slide, Curtis employed what, what I think most of us could, um, which, is, which is transforming this idea of purpose from one that most of our companies see, uh, where we just put a poster on the wall right, where we have some sort of catchphrase that the company has, we're all on a mission together. And instead of just having that poster on a wall, trying to create an environment where people are living holistic lives. And what I'll touch on here are, are guidelines for the teams that you're involved in. But I want to deconstruct those also, because for you individually, as you live your life within your company, I think they can be meaningful as well. Yeah, thank you, Vineet, for sharing that. Um, I think that involves, uh, first, helping employees to craft purpose at work to do what Curtis did to transform their jobs, connecting employees and connecting your own work more closely to service, um, thinking about the multiple sources of meaning and purpose in your lives, and building upon the core purpose of a company into multitude of different sources of purpose that different teams and different individuals can pursue. So we flip ahead, Jamie. Um, the first way to do this, I think, is to really approach this idea of crafting greater purpose into your work, uh, something that I think that Curtis did remarkably well, if you have a chance to go back and visit um, that video. So John's having a little bit of internet trouble, but he'll, he'll be back shortly. So John, we can't hear you. Yep. Can um, you hear me now? Yes. We, we lost you right at the beginning of the slide. So no, but my apologies, guys, I'll switch over to my phone if this continues. So I think there are really four ways to craft purpose in the way that Curtis did, uh, that each of us could focus on and that we could subsequently try and connect people and our teams to. The first of those is what I call crafting your work. Uh, it's also known as job crafting in the management literature, if you've seen this. 
Um, and this is the idea of taking the job you have and making it the job you want. So converting your job from being a bus driver to being a caretaker for kids and all of the different things that that involves. One of the first studies on this was a, a Yale researcher who followed around hospital janitors. And as you can imagine, a hospital janitor can be a really, really difficult job, right? It can be a dirty job. You're around sick people all the time. And she found there was this huge gap between those who felt great fulfillment and engagement in their work and those who didn't. And that some of the common characteristics of those who felt the greatest engagement was this idea that they crafted their jobs so that they were more than what they had been assigned as janitors. That could be little things. It was one uh, moved around artwork in the different rooms so that long-term patients uh, could see new and beautiful artwork rather than staring at the same thing every day. And she almost took it upon herself to be an interior designer uh, for these patients. Uh, another would experiment with different cleaning fluids to see what was least uh, troublesome to their patients. And throughout all of this, the, the key principle is how can you reconceive of your work so that it's something you would more enjoy doing and you can add tasks that are more uh, enjoyable, fulfilling, and purposeful for what you do. The second way in which I think you can do that is to make work a craft. And this is the old concept of craftsmanship. So when you'd find someone who would make shoes for a living or a carpenter, uh, the idea of perfecting everything that you do. You know, I am not a scrum master of the universe, uh, but I have had my own set of activities. When I was an analyst, I remember in my own work, I used to just really pride myself on creating the most beautiful interactive Excel models that I possibly could. For me, they were kind of like a work of art. I'd stay up really late. I'd make them as interactive as possible. And I think that in any job, you really have the opportunity to try and craft something or perfect it. The third way that I think anyone can approach this is to connect your work to service. Uh, so along with the next concept of deep and positive relationships, one of the two main ways in which you can create a more fulfilling life is to connect your life more deeply to service. If you look at almost all of the social science studies, serving others, uh, either through charity or even through just helping people out who are your friends or family, is one of the most psychologically rewarding activities that you can take on. And finding ways to do that in your work uh, is a remarkably important thing that we'll come to in a moment with a framework. And then finally, investing in positive relationships. So the number one determinant of whether you will have a happy, fulfilled, and flourishing life is the depth and breadth of your positive relationships. There was a great study called the Harvard Grant Study, uh, which, which followed a group of men over the course of 80 years. It's the longest longitudinal study uh, in history. And over this 80 years of life, uh, the primary researcher of this Harvard study, it, it transitioned a few times throughout the life of the study, obviously, because the original researchers passed away, was asked to summarize the core finding of the study. And he said that happiness is love, full stop. Basically, you study a person's entire life, the depth and breadth of their positive relationships is the most important determinant of whether they find that they have a flourishing life. And for so many of us, uh, we lack that in our work relationships. And we'll address that a bit further coming up. Flip ahead one more, Jamie. I want to deconstruct these a bit more, uh, a bit more in depth. And I want to start first with this idea of connecting work to service, because I think it's something that each of us can apply, and it's something that we can help our teammates to apply. And I think of this as a simple six-part framework. If you're looking for ways in which to conceive of your work as service, I think there are at least six different counterparties that each of us serves every day in our professional jobs. And among these six, maybe not all six are relevant to you. Maybe you can't find a great example from all six. But I think if we found three or four or five of these areas and really started to reconceive of our work as service to these parties in our work, uh, that we would find greater meaning. The first of these is clients or customers. Um, now, this, this is the lifeblood of any business. Uh, but many of the people in a business are not directly connected to clients, and that may be true for some of you, right? The external people that your company serves may be a step or two distant from you. I've worked in asset management, and uh, the core people that we serve are those whose pensions we're managing or 401k plans we're managing. Um, and yet, for most of the people in an organization, they never meet them, right? They deal with some of their institution that deals with them. And yet there is this in client or customer that if you take the time to focus on almost every business is serving someone well, you can't survive as a business unless you're doing something positive for an in client or customer and finding a way to make that real to you and your team 
is one of the most important ways in which to garner an attitude of service. The second and most obvious, I think, are colleagues. So every day we work with, with a ton of different people. And as we've talked about, depth and breadth of positive relationships is going to be the thing that drives our happiness the most. Um, and yet often we approach colleagues either uh, with a sense of isolation or with a sense of competitiveness uh, or even a sense of avoidance if there are people that we don't like. Instead, I think it can be transformational uh, to someone's work experience if we begin to approach at least some of our colleagues with an attitude of service. And again, I wouldn't take this too far. There are certainly instances uh, where we need to guard against colleagues who might be abusive or might misuse our time. And yet there's always someone out there we can help. And what I would always encourage my teams and myself to think through are who are three or four people amongst your colleagues that you could really think of yourselves as serving each day. And what I found is that increases the psychological happiness and fulfillment of the people who adopt that attitude, and it improves the relationships with those people that you're serving. The third group that I think almost any group of employees has a chance to serve is community. Um, companies have become much more open to this, where they're viewing themselves or as part of their different office locations, as being involved in the cities or countries in which they're a part of serving different community organizations. And yet there's always an opportunity for you to take, uh, take the lead on either crafting some new way in which your company can serve the community it, it's uh, placed within, or taking advantages of opportunities to serve alongside the company in those. Here in the US, we'll often do something like Habitat for Humanity, where we'll go out and build houses uh, for those in the community who don't have homes. There are often opportunities to run races together, uh, to raise money for good causes, to tutor in elementary schools. And I think that can be one of the most important ways in which companies can serve their communities and people can serve those communities with their companies. The fourth is probably the hardest uh, to articulate, and it's capital. Most of us think of the capital that owns our company as this distant figure, or at worst, uh, some malicious, uh, uh, irreverent group of shareholders. And yet, if we look at the structure of most of our companies, uh, the vast majority of us actually work in publicly traded companies, uh, where the primary holders of the value of that company are 401k plans or retirement plans of some sort, 529s, 529s which fund college educations. And I think it can actually behoove people to take a look at the ownership structure of their company and find ways in which they're really supportive of the people who benefit from their hard work. The fifth place I think we can look for service are partners. Uh, so you're scrum masters. Many of you are working with technology. Uh, presumably, you have a ton of external vendors, right? People that you rely on for the services that you provide. One of the questions I like to ask is, are, are we making the lives of our vendors or partners easier every day or harder? And are we trying to leave our vendors or partners uh, with a sense of fulfillment and flourishing? Or are we beating up on them? Most of us have been on the other side of that, where we've been the vendor or partner who's been disrespected uh, or taken advantage of, and we know it doesn't feel great. And so each of us has an opportunity every day, I think, to transform that type of relationship. And finally, uh, the sixth group that I think almost any of us could think about is um, people you love. You're at work for a reason. Most of you have families uh, that you support. Those of you who don't have families have causes that you love that you might donate to. Uh, you have parents uh, that you're helping to support, et cetera. And so always think of the people that you love that you're working for as you put in uh, what is an act of service through your day-to-day -day work. I'll so pause we there. Had the, we had the question, um, what, what is for C2P? But I think... Um, if I'm looking at that correctly, you're just describing the four C's are community, client, or customers, colleagues, capital, and then the two P is partners and people you love. Is that correct? You got it. I'm not so creative with the acronyms. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just a good way to remember the six things. Any other questions before we move on to the next concept? All right. We'll charge ahead, but I would love questions. I'm sorry I've, I've rambled on so much, but I would love to have a dialogue with folks too. Um, maybe the next framework to touch on, Jamie, is uh, on the next page. And this is the concept of purpose being plural. Um, and again, I just have six areas and I, and I use frameworks primarily because I think they help us to remember things. Uh, these are not perfect. It doesn't mean that there are not other sources of purpose, for example, but it's just a checklist you can check through. One of the dangers of the Hollywood version of purpose is if we make all of our purpose and meaning in life 
uh, structured on one thing, if that one thing goes away or if we never find it, it can feel like the end of the world, right? If your work is your entire identity, if you uh, have to exit a job for some reason, voluntarily or involuntarily, it can feel like your entire world's fallen apart. A relationship that's the center of your life, that's all of your source of purpose. If that relationship falls apart, it can feel like everything's falling apart. And instead, I think that most of us have a number of different sources of purpose. And if we learn to see those, that, that we'd have this reinforcing kind of tapestry of purpose around us, which would mean that we're not let down if any individual source of purpose goes away. And what I encourage people to do is just to look at six different areas to think through three individual examples of places you're getting purpose in each of those areas. And if you can do that, almost every person then has close to two dozen sources of purpose that they can think about every day uh, that hopefully provide a real foundation for happiness and fulfillment. I call this the labors. It's slightly more creative than 4C2P because uh, it spells a word uh, and hopefully you can remember it, but each letter simply stands for a different area. The first is love. I don't think that confused with, with R2D2, 4C, 3P, I don't know. 4C, 3P, yeah, uh, uh, C3PO. Uh, it's, it's definitely like a Star Wars droid, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we do have some questions, but would you rather answer them now yeah, or, let's or, dive or in. wait till the end? Uh, I'm happy to take one now and then we can jump into labors. Um, okay, there's one in chat there if you can see chat. Yeah, so I don't think they're mutually exclusive at all. In fact, um, you will have some people who overlap between the different categories. Uh, your colleagues can sometimes be your clients. We'll often refer to people as internal clients, for example, and think about how to serve them. Um, and you can co-create with, with vendors or partners for clients. So I, I completely uh, agree. Capital is certainly the hardest one. Um, it's the one though that I think it, certain people get a hang up with because they're disconnected from the source of capital. They think, ah, oh, I just work in a publicly traded company. You know, there are just people getting rich off of this. Typically that's not actually true. So uh, maybe this one I just plugged in because I work in asset management. But if you look at most of the companies in the world, uh, the biggest source of funding for those is pension plans, uh, education savings plans, retirement plans. And so most people can actually feel good that the ownership of their company is doing something positive for the world. And that's why I incorporate it because it's something most people miss. And yet for 90% of companies that you research, uh, there's some positive use of that capital that's at play. But that's a great question about whether those are mutually exclusive. Any others on the 4C uh, 2P framework before we move on? And please feel free to unmute and speak up if you'd like to as well. All right, I'll hit the labors, but uh, we, can, we can pause right after that and answer any questions as well. So the first is love, and this is depth and breadth of meaningful relationships, which we've talked about a lot. And I encourage people to sit down and write down three to four relationships that they want to deeply invest in and give them a great sense of meaning. And to make sure in this pursuit of professional purpose that you're not neglecting those relationships. The second is avocations, which is kind of a big word for hobbies and self-improvement. Uh, this is what you do in your free time. And it can seem trivial, but I actually think a lot of us get a great deal of purpose from the things that we pursue in our free time, whether it's running, uh, knitting, playing uh, soccer in a league or softball in a league, uh, writing, uh, maybe it's making uh, crafts. There's something that each of us does outside of work that gives us a sense of craft and fulfillment. And I think if we lose time for that in the midst of work, we often neglect an important source of purpose in our lives. And I push people to think through two to three things that they like to do outside of work that have a sense of craft to them from which they get some fulfillment. And if you don't have those things, to think about picking something up that can fill that role. The third is beauty, and this is easy to overlook uh, if you're stuck in an office all day or a home office. Um, I found that this was one people began to encounter during COVID. Uh, I spoke to a group recently where uh, someone shifted to working from home, and because they were trapped at home in their apartment, they found that they, for the first time, were going on walks around parks during the day, taking phone calls. Can you guys hear me? I'm back now. Okay. 
Um, and so beauty is something where it can be as simple as putting artwork around your desk or around your work area. It can be getting outside more uh, as you work, taking calls on a walk. It can even be taking your family to national parks or, or getting outside and, and seeing something beautiful. Uh, but I think losing a, a sense of beauty is actually highly correlated with a feeling of, of distress and finding new sources of beauty, whether they be vid visiting museums, creating art yourself, or experiencing nature can be remarkably fulfilling. The fourth is occupation. And we've started to talk about that with our framework. Um, I think that anywhere you spend 40 to 50 hours a week, should be a great source of purpose in your life. And if it's not a source of purpose, you really need to think about how you approach that and turn it into something more meaningful. The fifth source is a bit controversial to talk about in business audiences, but I think really fundamental to most people. 77% uh, of the world identifies as religious in some way or a follower of a faith tradition. And I think it's really worth thinking through your religion and philosophy. There are a bunch of different studies uh, that show that those who are religious adherents, who pray regularly, who attend services, actually experience greater happiness and fulfillment. And for many, the majority of the world, this is actually one of the top sources of purpose. So I don't, I don't pretend that everyone should follow the same faith. I wouldn't tell people uh, exactly what to do, but I do think if you haven't reflected on what religion, faith, tradition, or life philosophy that you follow, it's a real opportunity for you to delve into something deeper uh, that can be a source of purpose for almost everyone in the world. And then finally, which we talked about, service. Um, service uh, is not just important at work. I think it's important in our lives broadly. If you look at the social science, again, service is one of the things that leads to the greatest source of fulfillment in life. And if you're not finding ways to serve others, it can be serving food in a soup kitchen. It can be volunteering at an a nursing home or, uh, or a kid's daycare or a church youth group. Um, just the idea of getting hands on and helping people is something that can transform your life. Uh, if happiness is love, uh, we've got a great question from Stefan. Why only limit to two or three people? Why not change the mindset into loving mindset and find meaning in human interaction first instead of trying to love a few people? Um, and service is based on deep love for others. Stefan, 100%. Uh, so I think the more... Um, positive relationships you can have, the better. However, I think it's difficult to operate purely from a generalized sense of love, right? You can, you can love others and you can try and treat everyone you encounter with love. And I think that's a remarkably important thing. And I think it'd be transformal, transformational for the world if we did. Um, what the research shows, and I think what our experience shows, however, is that it's the depth and breadth of positive relationships so finding ways to really dig into a few individual lives, and that's not three or four. I just, I just tell people two to four to start off with to make sure that it's not uh, too big a mountain to climb. You know, for most people, this is probably 10 or 12 or 20 people uh, that they can, they can have a deep relationship with. It probably is harder after that. Um, but I would encourage certainly people to adopt a broad mindset of love, uh, but to make sure that um, there are at least a few relationships that are mutually fulfilling, that are based on love that you're digging into. And if you can't identify more than two or three or four, uh, that you begin to try and develop those and focus on that as an area that you can improve. And again, Joanna's 100% right. I'm an extrovert, so I love to wander into rooms and meet new people and uh, kind of develop relationships. But a lot of people are more deep one-on-one -on -one, uh, type folks. And so I think that that framework can work for them too. Questions though. Um, any other topics here before we move on? Stefan, thank you for those. And Joanna, thank you for your comment. All right. I'll move on to uh, maybe one final thing and then I'll just open it up for everyone. Uh, so Philippa had one more slide, Jamie. And um, I want to talk about what this can mean for, um, actually go back to the, uh, the slide with the chart, Jamie. There we go. I want to go back to what this means for a company. Uh, most of you work within companies. Most of you are leaders of teams, it sounds like. And I want to think about a framework for how a company can think about purpose. So mostly we've covered how the individual can reconceive of their life and job. I'm going to transmit this to a company. And I want to start with this supposition, as we articulated earlier, that purpose in a company isn't just a statement on a wall. Instead, a purpose-driven company or culture 
is about creating an environment where it's possible for each individual human being to flourish and to experience a sense of purpose, right? It's not just about having a company with a mission. It's creating a culture where each individual feels fulfilled and purposeful, which is a much bigger challenge, but can create a much more dynamic environment for people. And frankly, is the right thing to do, right? Because you're trying to invest in the lives of others and make them better. And I would encourage you to focus on three things here. One is for the company or even for your team, having a clear mission or vision. This is your why, the Simon Sinek version of start with why. It's the purpose for what you do. And it keeps everyone oriented to a cause. And if you don't have that mission or vision, I do think it's difficult for people to buy into an organization. The second are a series of values, the principles by which you operate. And again, if you work in a big company like I did for part of my life, um, it might be worth defining these for your team. We always had a team set of values in every environment in which I've worked that wasn't misaligned with corporate values, but sought to build on them in our own unique way. And these are the principles or virtues that you hope people embrace. Um, for example, uh, in, our, in our company right now, one of our principles is that our excellence is a witness. And so it's this idea that uh, we help encourage other people in our space by doing our work with excellence, right? Uh, one of our great, great values is to love others, right? To lean into others and make sure, as Stefan articulated earlier, that we approach everyone that we interact with, with this sense of love and caring and trying to invest in them. Um, thinking through what your values are and how to articulate those with your team, I think is a very important thing so that everyone can stay oriented. It also determines what type of people join so that you can create a consistent culture. And then finally, I would focus on what I call satellite sources of purpose. Uh, these are activities that aren't misaligned with the mission of your company, but are smaller and more granular so that people can have their own individualized sense of purpose. This can be as easy as a, a company women's group that you help run, where you're trying to help female employees uh, experience a greater sense of meaning, recruit better for female employees. Uh, it can be a, a company running club uh, where someone gets to invest in that, encouraging physical health in their company. Uh, it can be a project that people take on to try and rethink the way in which they approach recruiting for example, and recruit more members from diverse communities. And so these little satellite sources of purpose are important to build into an organization and encourage so that everyone's not just focused on the one key mission of the organization, but the various missions that give them the most purpose and fulfillment. So I'm gonna pause there. Uh, I think Stefan had popped up a question there. And then um, uh, I would open it up to everyone else in the last few minutes that we have, just so that we can talk about any topics on your mind. Uh, so Stefan asks, is purpose really about why or rather about who we are and how we can help others with what we have um, and who we have become after overcoming challenges in life? Yeah, I, th I think it's probably about both. You know, for most people, the why is what we can do to serve others, right? A mission of an organization is always, almost always how that organization serves the world or their particular clients. I think a personal mission statement is often about how you'll be of service to others, whether it be your family, your friends, uh, or the world at large. And so I think adopting this mindset of service and helping others is a big part of why, and that the most compelling whys are often how we can use our talents and abilities uh, to help others, either in a personal or a professional context. Um, what other questions are on people's minds as we go through this? Or does this resonate? Or are there, there are pieces that you struggle with that you don't think we covered? Stefan, those are, don't shut up. Those are great questions. I think they were very good. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. You know, I wonder if, you know, this is, um, you know, a, a bit of a paradigm shift, I think, for many people in terms of the idea of um, finding your perfect purpose versus crafting your purpose, right? And that said, do you have any um, supplemental kind of worksheets or things that people can start to, um, you know, think about their life in a different way so that they can craft their purpose, you know, something that kind of guides them through the process of, of crafting their purpose yes. or purposes? Yeah, for sure. So uh, what I would say, and that I didn't, I didn't plant this question uh, with Jamie, but um, in the book, as one of the guides, what we do is at the end of each chapter, we actually lay out a series of questions for those who want to reflect on your purpose. So you could almost, we encourage people to keep what I call a purpose journal, 
where it's just a little notebook where you work through the questions in the book. And the hope is that after reflecting on each of the different topics that we cover, Jamie, that you will have articulated a lot of these things. There's a more in-depth set of materials that are that are um, available at HBR for purpose or for purchase with their corporate packets. They have a series of videos and tools uh, that you can use. Uh, those are for sale, so they don't let me uh, give them away for free right now. Uh, but I will say a lot of the material is actually covered in the book uh, as well, and that could give you a good start if you're interested in that. Because I do think, Jamie, this is one of those things where it's better as an exercise than just a topic to listen to. Like. Sure. Uh, the concepts are helpful, but unless you work through them in an individualized way, I think it can be difficult to really action them. And so I'd encourage people to, to do exactly what you're saying. How can we find our purpose of life that keeps us motivated? Uh, Najam, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, again, my view is that actually your life has multiple purposes. I think one of the things that gives us anxiety is this idea of, oh, my life has this single purpose I've got to find. And if I don't find it, then I've missed the purpose of my life, then I've abandoned it. There's a great book called Designing Your Life in the US. I don't know if people have encountered it, but it was written by two professors at Stanford who are melding business in the design school. So how you design great products. And one of their concepts, I, I don't know exactly how they measured this, but they did surveys and found that each person has at least like six and a half uh, really great lives out there that they could follow six or six, six or seven different life paths and end up equally happy. And I kind of think that's true. I think a lot of life is finding what gives us fulfillment uh, or joy, what's a unique use of our talents um, in anything that we're doing. And instead of trying to look for this one transformational thing, looking daily uh, to see what can give us greater purpose uh, in our personal or professional lives, Najam. Uh, the one area I get what I think is a more um, uh, substantive objection to that, there, there are many people of religious faith, for example, who, who think of that faith as the central purpose in their life. And I do indeed think for religious believers that can be true. Um, I think that doesn't relieve religious believers, though, of the obligation to kind of think practically about what that means for their life here on earth. So even if you consider your faith kind of the central source of purpose in your life, uh, there are all these other opportunities to express it. And so finding those aligned with your, your core faith uh, is something incredibly important. Uh, I've got Stefan with one more. Regrets. Regrets. I don't know Daniel's uh, concept of regrets, Stefan. So. Um, it's hard for me to think about that uh, specifically. Did you want to say more there or um, where I can answer the best I can? And you can unmute, I think, and speak if you want to. Well, I would say um, the, the regrets topic, I do think it's worth looking back. I would frame it less as regrets and more as just the ability to learn from your past experiences where you've missed out on something. I think lingering on regrets too much can actually get you mired a little bit in anxiety. Whereas this idea of trying to think through in a structured way, your life, your current life and your past life and see what's given you a great sense of purpose. There's a purpose um, exercise that we have in the book where you literally go through your day-to-day -day tasks and sees what, see is what uh, is giving you the greatest joy and purpose day to day and what's giving you the least joy and purpose. And you can try and find out um, ways in which to tweak your daily life to maximize that. And so that might be a way of, of thinking through it in a structured way. And I will say, uh, Katrin, I think that's a different John Coleman. Uh, I'll be John William <laughs> Coleman. I was just going to say that. <laughs> uh, but an agility chef is a really interesting uh, uh, profession. So I look forward to meeting that John Coleman. Um, I would say, you know, it's been great to speak to all of you. I know we're running out of time. Um, would love to engage, would obviously be grateful if you'd consider picking up the book and writing a review. And uh, Jamie and uh, Katrin and Mark, I'm just, I'm just grateful for the chance to be with you all today. Yes, thank you, John. It, uh, we so appreciate you coming and, and, and visiting our, our unique group of, of Agile practitioners, our global group. But I think I think the topic crafting your purpose is is relevant to to everyone. Um, so I, you know, I would encourage uh, folks also to. Um, I'm being a little sidetracked here. I'm trying to do two things at once, but there. I think we have the right LinkedIn um, 
LinkedIn link in the chat now. At any rate, thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And, and you know, would love to even have you back again to dive deeper into this topic. I think it's fascinating. And it's, it's, it's really, I think, what a lot of people are looking for, as you pointed out in many of, many of your um, metrics at the beginning. And those, I noticed, were all pre-COVID. So I'd be really interested to know what that looks like now, because I have a feeling it's changed even, it looked dramatic then, but I have a feeling that those statistics are, are dramatically different even than your first uh, introductory slide. So I'd be interested to, to know what those look like now, you know, in our post-COVID world. Same, they're slowly coming out, although I try not to rely on them too much because COVID was such an extraordinary thing. But yes, the metrics typically have gotten a little bit worse. And, uh, and I think it's more urgent than ever to think about it. So thank you, Jamie, for hosting this and, and to all of you for thinking about this topic and best of luck to you as you do. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. So appreciate it. Um, we will post the uh, recording on our YouTube uh, later if you'd like to watch it again um, or share with a friend. So uh, everyone have a great start to your week. Um, hopefully or you, we got you started off well on this Tuesday with John. So um, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Thanks again, John.